Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Bruce Van Vrede with Brady Ware, and I'm here with Mark Cassens, uh, also with Brady Ware, and he leads our estate gifts and trusts uh, practice. Uh, we're back to talk another round of, uh, of trust. Uh, Mark, I think this week our topic is on the intentionally defective grantor trust. So uh, why don't you start us off and kind of give us a general idea. What, what's the meaning of this kind of trust? Thanks, Bruce. So the idea of these intentionally defective grantor trusts is to sell and gift an appreciating asset uh, to a trust in exchange for a note. Uh, the gift has to be uh, part of the transfer. It doesn't have to be part of the transfer. It usually is part of the transfer in order to have enough collateral uh, behind that note uh, to make it a valid note. Uh, it has to be a valid exchange. And it's between the grantor and the trust, which is a separate legal entity. Uh, it's two different taxpayers, basically. But because this is a grantor trust, it's disregarded for income tax purposes. The state tax purposes, totally different. It, it is a separate entity, uh, and it's out of that person's estate. So what are we doing here? We're, we're moving uh, appreciated asset, vault. we're putting a note back in. So cash, basically, it's cash equivalent. Um, so the interest on the note, and it has to have valid stated interest, it's a legal note. Uh, the interest on the note is being paid with the principal, uh, and the, the cash that's going into the trust is from that appreciating asset. Normally, it's a small business interest, so we have an S-corp interest, uh, which is allowed because it's a grantor trust, or we have a partnership interest or an LLC. Uh, so the distributions from that pass-through entity going into the trust uh, because it's the shareholder or member, uh, and then that, that trust entity is paying uh, principal and interest on that note to the grantor. Now, these transactions, uh, one, the sale and the interest payments uh, are tax-free because you, you can't have an exchange between yourself. And that's really what you're doing with a grantor trust that's disregarded for tax purposes, income tax purposes. So all of this is kind of happening by moving uh, from the right pocket to the left pocket as far as income tax is, is concerned. Um, it, it, what happens then if um, that pass-through income is is no longer kind of um, being passed out to the grantor? That happens when the, the note has been paid off. Um, sometimes that's a triggering event. Um, and there's other times that the uh, the uh, triggering event can can be a provision that the the grantor gives up. So um, but it has to cease to be a grantor trust. So what makes these things, you've, you've touched on a couple different uh, nuances, but what makes these things a grantor trust? The biggest provision that we use in the intentionally defective grantor trust is to, is to give the grantor a, a power to substitute. Uh, that's part of the grantor trust provisions in the Internal Revenue Code. So what that means is that uh, the grantor has the ability to take out what they originally put in there and to exchange it for another asset, totally unrelated asset usually, um, but it has to be equal value. So you can substitute one asset for another asset uh, and perfectly fine, not a tax taxable event. Again, it's it's just like the sale that happened before and the income or the uh, interest payments that are, that are going back and forth. It's to yourself. So it, it doesn't matter uh, for income tax purposes, uh, not a taxable event. The, the power to substitute can also be turned off, which was what I was touching on with the triggering event. Uh, there's provisions in there where the, the grantor can say, you know what, uh, I'm not going to substitute anymore. So I give up that right. Once that right is given up, it ceases to be a grantor trust. Um, and like I said as well, that other triggering event can be death uh, of the grantor. And like any other grantor trust, once that, uh, once that happens, it's an irrevocable trust. Um, it, on a normal living trust, it, it you know ceases to be a revocable trust, ceases to be a grantor trust, and it turns into just a, a testamentary trust, or you know it's the grantor's out of it at that point. They've they've passed away, so uh, these can also be set up to expire, uh, or the trust can you know distribute everything out uh, when that note is paid off. Um, 
but they um, and then the assets are uh, distributed out to the beneficiaries. Okay. Why would you choose um, for these? Why would you choose to keep it a grantor trust even after the note is paid off? Yeah, so because it's a grantor trust, the uh, income is taxed to the grantor. Um, and if that trust remains a grantor trust after that note is paid off, that income that is being passed through by that original asset um, is accumulating in the trust. It's not distributed out anymore to that grantor uh, because they have no right to that income. Uh, their right to the income ceased when the note was paid off. So the income is uh, being put into the trust, adding to the trust assets. Um, and that income tax uh, is being paid by the grantor. So they're not really being reimbursed anymore. So their their estate is being depleted by those income tax payments. Perfectly legal. It's it's their trust because it still has grantor status. Um, but that income then is being accumulated in the trust to be invested in other assets or or to just build up the cash value. Uh, all the while, that appreciating asset continues to appreciate. So it can really be a uh, a, a really strong uh, way to kind of move assets. Uh, after the fact, uh, because you're you're paying the taxes, it's depleting your cash reserve, the grantor's cash reserve, uh, and then that that trust is kind of building upon itself and uh, growing exponentially. Uh, you know, there's some clients that really aren't looking for that result; they're just looking to uh, transition uh, uh, small business or to transfer ownership of a small business. Uh, by using a, a relatively small part of their lifetime exemption. Because don't forget, we might be, you know, transferring $10 million of a uh, of an asset. Uh, but most of that is, is a sale. We're only using a very small part of that as a gift. So we've used a very small part of our lifetime exemption for a $10 million gift, just as an example. And then if we leave the grantor status alone, that $10 million gift, while it's already appreciated on its own, it just continues to appreciate even more because that cash distribution from that um, asset is, is being left left alone in the trust and, and there to reinvest. So either way you go, uh, the purpose of these trusts is, is really, it's a freeze. It's an estate tax freeze uh, because you're exchanging uh, dollar for dollar, basically, at the point of transfer. Uh, but then what happens to that after is really where it grows and can can really make a difference. Um, and the exchange of the appreciating asset for the note, uh, all that appreciation is moved out of the, out of the estate. Um, then on the other side of this, um, to the extent uh, it's it's a, it's a little bit better uh, cash flow than than just a straight gift or maybe even a taxable sale. Uh, you know, we might have a, uh, a situation where, you know, the, the, let's say the parent is retiring and wants to transition the business and they don't really, they don't want to, uh, sell it, uh, to their kids. Um, but they, they do want to transition the ownership. Um, well, they might not have a lot of their lifetime exemption left, or they want to retain a lot of their lifetime exemption. This is, this is a good way to do that. Uh, it, because you use a relatively small part of that to transfer a pretty large asset, honestly. Um, so the the important part of this is that um, it, if you're using a gift part of that, if it's not just a, a cash um, deal gift type of cash, um, you have to have a valuation of that small business uh, for the adequate disclosure. Uh, that starts the three-year statute of limitations uh, from the filing date of the gift tax return. And then just kind of a quick, quick recap of this. this uh, it's a grantor trust, a separate legal entity. Uh, it's irrevocable. Uh, it cannot be changed after, after the document is signed. It cannot be changed. Uh, you also need a trustee, uh, and it can't be the grantor. You can't be the trustee of your own uh, idget. Uh, and then the assets are out of the trust or sorry the assets in the trust are out of the grantor's estate um thanks mark appreciate the description 
uh, and walk it through the some of the nuances to this. And, and as you can see, uh, not only with this one, uh, but all the other estates, trusts, uh, videos that we've been talking about, all of those also have a lot of intricacies to them. Uh, so please make sure you're working with a trusted advisor. Uh, Mark Kasson's here at Brady Ware can certainly uh, fill that role for you um, as uh, as you try to make sure these things are set up properly for you and for your situations. Uh, so thanks again for listening and watching. Uh, please check out the other videos that are on our website and uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, through the contact us on our website or uh, you're free to email Mark directly, mcassens, K-A-S-S-E-N-S, -S -S -E at bradyware.com. Thank you very much, and we'll see you for the next one.